All right. Hi, everybody. Y'all are all lazy. Come on. Come on. Hi, everybody. Like, for real? I'm going to need some jazz hands. This is a youth crowd, y'all. I go to, like, never mind. I'm not going to say what I was going to say. I'm very politically incorrect, but can I hear the youthfulness in this room, please? Like, hello? Hi? Hi! All right. I'm not really a hype girl. I'm just, I just pretend sometimes. I channel my inner 12-year-old that died a long time ago. But anyways, my name's Hazami. Um, as you guys know, I think we're going to play the SDG groove, right? Okay, we're going to get... So Jade back there. Hi, Jade. Can you wait, everybody? Jade back there, who you guys will hear from, um, is part of an organization called Entertainment for Change. And what they're trying to do is, you know, like all those, like, I'm, you're going to see that I'm not a millennial. I'm like a fake person. But like the dap thing and whatever this thing is, and the floss thing, I can't do it, whatever, you know? Um, they're trying to make an SDG groove thingy. Uh, and they're about to play it. So whoever wants to feel inspired and get up and do your groove thing, Please do. So with that, go. I'm going to try to do it up here, too. Thanks, whoever laughed. I hate you. <laughs> Some change to spare. Ain't got no food to eat. We got some we can share. You got a belly ache. We'll get you medicated. You gotta make the grade. We'll get you educated. He, she, they, you are welcome here. Thirsty, well, ooh, the water's clear. Ooh, we got a lot to do. Hot goals, let's take control now. We're solar powered In this economy We're working by the hour I got a great idea maybe. We need to innovate And if we talk it out maybe. We'll all live equally We'll build a new community When we consume responsibly Ooh, we got a lot to do Hot goals, let's take control now Ooh, That was some awesome stuff. I can't dance, so I'm not even going to try. But anyways, um, we're going to go straight into my presentation. Um, so a lot of um, what I, we do at the Global People Summit and the Humanity Lab is trying to get people, everyday people, to realize their, their power for change. And we learned through a lot of the work that we were doing that there was no shortage of passion and talent but oftentimes people just didn't know how to be useful. So this training, this is a short iteration of it. At the very end, there'll be an e our email address. So feel free to send it to us. We'd love to come to schools, universities, workplaces, um, corporations, wherever. Our goal is to infuse as much passion for action as possible and to give you the toolkits to go out there and make change happen that needs to happen in the world. So with that, do I have a clicker of some sorts? It's on the podium. Oh, there's Kelly's phone. Should we take selfies? Yeah, hold on. Well, no, I don't have the time right now, but I would. Um, where do I point it? Oh, there we go. So the world sucks, as we know it. There's a lot of problems, and we're going to get into those really quick, quickly. And the reason I want to start uh, with talking about the state of the world is that there, right now it's so easy to be so far removed from the realities of the world in which we're living. And there's some stats here that are 
I, I promise I'll figure out the clicker. There we go. I was pushing the wrong button. Apologies. So 65.5 million people around the world are forcibly displaced, and we hear often about refugee crises and various other things. I don't know actually how to click. It's the forward one, right? Yeah, it's not. Oh. Um, anyway, 87% of disasters in the past 10 years are assumed to be related to climate change. Um, this is not working. I don't know if I'm just not pointing it at the right place. Am I not? <laughs> Thank you. 12% uh, of the world's population lives on less than $2.50 a day. Next slide. Sorry. This... Should I just take a minute? Okay. Um, and this, to me, is one of the most jarring stats. 29,000 children under the age of five die each day. Each day. Let's repeat that. Each day due, due to preventable causes. That's 12 children, 21 children each minute. We've been here since early in the morning. Do the math. How many kids have died while we've been gathering here talking about changing the world? So how do we fix this mess? And the SDGs, as we've heard throughout the day, are a roadmap for action. In essence, there's 17 goals with the goal of changing the world. Now, what's behind these goals? 17 goals, there's 169 targets that provide, in essence, a blueprint, so to say, of how we're going to actually achieve peace, prosperity, and development to every nation and every person globally. And these were adopted by member states at the United Nations in 2015. And in essence, for some people that do know, the Millennium Development Goals and it weren't necessarily as successful as they intended to be, and the SDGs came as a way to not only enhance progress globally, but also to kind of create a multi-stakeholder process around the goals, to actually share responsibility among stakeholders, saying to corporations, individuals, communities, this is your agenda too. This is not a UN agenda or a government agenda. This is a collective global agenda and global roadmap for action. And one of the things is you'll oftentimes hear people say, like, what is your goal? You know, it's like one goal issue. The reality is goals are so interconnected. You can't have gender equity or gender justice without also looking at infrastructure and education and poverty. You can't ha fight poverty if you don't also look at connectivity, lack of partnerships, corruption, lack of peace and security, and so on and so forth. So as much as people will tell you to pick a goal, the reality behind the goals is that they are, they are all interconnected and interdependent. And I think that's one of the biggest things with the SDGs is intersectionality becomes more important than it has before. Now, what will it cost to actually achieve the SDGs? Lofty goals, great, really hard to achieve, but there's also massive financial deficits in order to achieve the goals themselves. And it requires, as you see here, mobilizing an additional $2.5 trillion a year to achieve these ambitious goals by 2030. Whoops. Now, the challenge becomes, too, is that clickers and I are not friends, guys. That trust globally is eroding. And this is something that I really want to stress. This is, we're talking a lot about young people. One in 10 young people do not trust government. Uh, that's, that's pretty jarring as a fact. And 6% and of young people trust companies, which is also extremely low. And so as much as we have all of these ambitious, like co corporate social responsibility agendas, as much as we have all of this, there's still a massive disconnect in trust and how we're actually building the infrastructure to connect people to solutions. <laughs> um, ineffective solutions are often driven, and this is a, based on a lot of the work and research we've been doing at the Humanity Lab, is really looking at why there's this apathy happening and why what we perceive to be inaction around the goals. Um, number one is apathy. People just feel like it's so big, I just don't know what to do, I'm not even gonna try. It's so overwhelming. Silos. There are corporate silos, as we talked about earlier. There's no shared metrics between institutions and organizations. Governments do their thing, civil society does its other, people are protesting in the streets. And everybody is just kind of doing their own little thing in a bubble, hoping that their bubble gets so big that it starts to like push other bubbles out of the way. But as we know, that's, that's not the reality of, of what happens. And silos also create a lot of unintended consequences and a lot of inaction and ineffective action. And then complexity. The complexity of the situations, as I mentioned, all the goals are super interconnected and so many global problems are so sticky and murky. And we're gonna get into this in just a little bit. Most of the biggest problems of the world, if you actually take a moment to think about it, are based on values and human beliefs. A human belief cannot be measured. If I believe a girl does not have a right to go to school, 
No institutional building is going to change that if it's against my value system as a person. Or if I believe I have the right to own a gun, who are you to tell me I do not have the right to own a gun? So a law can be passed, but aspirationally, I'm not there with you. So a lot of what we talk about in the work that we do is really thinking about um, challenging the status quo and challenging perspectives on development across the board. And it does require to challenge thinking inside and outside of systems. And I stress inside of systems because far too often we look at creating alternative processes. But history has showed us that we need to actually start to think about how to create embedded solutions because the reality is I don't see in any near future that we're gonna create an entire new United Nations but a lot of people say that they've stopped believing in the effectiveness of an institution like the United Nations. So can technology and innovation fix things? I heard earlier one of the uh, panelists was talking about AI uh, and various other things, and one of the things I wanna just bring to your attention is you know, the, the positive parts of innovation, but also there's a lot of murkiness around innovation and tech. Um, so we hear about all these cool things, and innovations, Innovation does allow us and enable us to tackle some extreme problems around the world. But what we're not necessarily thinking about is the unintended consequences of innovation and technology and programming that we're working on. So again, drones being used, medical deliveries, finding bodies under rubble, post-conflict, post-natural disaster. Uh, there's a lot of efforts, a lot of UN agencies and a lot of private sector companies are really starting to look at the intersectionality of high tech, big tech, big data, and how that can actually solve societal issues. Apps, as you guys probably have come across, used to distribute information for coordination, democratizing access to information, which is what we were founded on. The belief of the Global People Summit is that if you give people access to information and conversations that shape the world, then they'll have a role and a seat at the table in doing so. <laughs> One day, at the end of this presentation, I'll figure this thing out. But is it always good? The unintended consequences of good actions is something that most institutions do not figure out how to resolve. So I'm gonna put two, two companies up here real quick. Do you guys know of either? Have you heard of either? Yeah? How many people would think that Tesla, green cars, it's a good idea, right? Raise your hand if you believe that green cars are good. Oh, okay, not, not, not entire, entirety of the room. But what if I told you that the cobalt in the batteries to create Tesla cars is mined using child labor, child slavery, in the DRC and an African continent? What is more important, saving the environment or saving children, right? So you start to then create more complexity around it. Tom's Shoes, how many of you, oh no, I'm not gonna ask how many of you own Tom's, but how many of you have heard of Tom's? Great, yeah, great, buy one, get one, right? You buy a pair of shoes, you send a pair of shoes. Have you guys heard about the unintended consequences of Tom's? And they changed their business model, so props to them, but in essence, what they did is they eroded local economy, they eroded local markets, and people didn't need the shoes, right? So who was actually benefiting from the Tom's model? The people that bought the shoes that could pat themselves on the back to say, I helped a child, not necessarily the output, which actually hurt local communities more than it helped. And they did issue a statement and they corrected a lot of what they've been doing. But the problem is, until there's outrage or knowledge, these things go on and we continue to buy things or do things thinking that we're incentivizing a global good ecosystem, when in actuality we're servicing an agenda of a specific entity at the expense of not developing or creating, contributing to positive impact. So I love this little meme, it's what, what are you working on? Trying to fix the problems I created when I tried to fix the problems I created when I tried to fix the problems when I, and it can go on and on and on. So um, we're gonna get into more of the, the masterclass part of this. So understanding the water in which you swim, and I am a very happy um, graduate of the Kennedy School at Harvard University where we actually, I spent a lot of my time working on adaptive leadership, uh, and it's a framework that is taught very, um, in a very impactful way at the school, so if, anyone, if anyone's interested in adaptive leadership, definitely look up the Harvard Kennedy School program. But I'm gonna go through some of the kind of cliff notes of it merged with some of the adaptive trainings that we've been working on. So understanding the water in which you swim is important. So you wanna create change, but understanding how you make change, when to make change, your role in the change, and so on and so forth, starts to become really important. Does a fish know it's swimming? Is it thinking every day consciously, I am in water? Do you consciously think about breathing? Right, so we take for granted a lot of the realities of the world in which we're living and the world in which we're operating. So we're gonna do this quick experiment. You guys have to be interactive with me. So describe what you see in front of me, in front of you. What is this thing? I'm just whoever, just yell it out. It's a piece of paper. Now if you're gonna describe it so that someone in the back corner can draw it, can you actually describe it for me? Okay, blank, it's white, it's a rectangle. 
longer than it is tall, right? So someone back there, if she described that, you think you can sketch it? Anyone at the back table back there? All right, cool. Now I'm gonna scrunch it up. Now I'm gonna ask you to do the exact same thing. Oh, that light hits it so perfectly. All right, <laughs> thanks light. Um, describe what you see in front of you. Describe the shapes, describe what you see in front of you. Crumple piece of paper, but I need her to draw it, or him, or whomever is back there to draw it identical to what you see. Shadows, shapes, everything. Different angles, do you know what different angles means? Can you draw, draw different angles? No, okay. Well, from my angle, it actually looks like a penguin with a little flappy thing. Um, but, you know, if he or she or whomever anywhere in the room has never seen a penguin, would you know what to draw? Right? So if I'm a little shorter and I'm looking at it here, the penguin has disappeared. Now it looks like a, oh, that's like a, mm. I don't know what that thing is, but it's a thing. And then, in essence, this might seem like a silly point, but the point of this entire thing is what the heck is this problem? When it was white and clear and square, we all knew what the problem was. But I crumpled it, and based on where you're sitting in the room, your knowledge, your vantage point, your experience, your background, your comprehension, you define this thing differently, right? Now apply that to problems of the world, right? So it might be education was our blank piece of paper. This is education. What does it mean to different people? All right, we get a lot more complex. So what we talk about is two levels of problems. There's technical problems and adaptive problems. A technical problem, like this, flat, this uh, stop sign, the light breaks, right? We know where to go to fix it, right? You call somebody, the traffic light's pretty important, we all agree. You'd call someone in your lo local government and they'd say, hey, this thing doesn't work, the power plant, the power company or whomever will come out and fix it. There's not really much need to create solutions. Right? You don't have to invite stakeholders to the table. We call it a technical problem. It's clear, the problem is defined, you have the capacity and the appropriate tools to fix it. Now, an adaptive problem is a little more tricky. Gun violence, what's the problem? Are the guns the problem? Are the video games the problem? Are, is lack of parenting the problem? Is it the fact that young men have toxic role models? Or is it the fact that white nationalism is on the rise? Or is it the fact that, you know, people just are angry and that's their right to shoot people? What is the problem? Is it that we don't have laws, right? So when you start to think about the problems when you come to more technical issues, there's a gap in not only the capacity, knowledge, and skills, but really starting to think about what does the solution start to look like and to whom, and how can you bring these people along with you? And we talk about authority not being effective. You're not gonna call somebody and be like, hi, there's gun problems. I mean, we've been trying to do this in the United States for ages, and we've gotten nowhere. The problem is, who is the solution? Is the president own the solution? Does the community own the solution? Do schools own the solution? Does parents, do parents own the solution? Do mental health services own the solution? What is my problem? And as such, what is my solution? So the problem is there's no right solution to complex global problems. I'm being told that my time is up, unfortunately. But leadership, in essence, starts to st steer people towards a solution. And a part of that is really mobilizing the capacity to have people see the problem the same way that you do. So a lot of us are solving for 10 steps down the line. We're not realizing, what are, are we actually solving the same thing? Do we actually see the problem the same way? Do we identify the resources and capacity the same way? And can I get other people to see this vision for this thing that might be a problem. And this is a piece of paper and we couldn't even agree on what this little tortoise thing looked like, right? Could you imagine any other issues? Stick refugee uh, issues in here, stick migration, stick border problems in there, stick, name a problem, we got it. So leadership is about creating collective responsibility and I talked about this earlier. We all have to be part of this global ecosystem for solutions because no one owns a problem. And the problem with a lot of the way our organizations function today is everyone feels they have ownership of the problem itself. And I promise I'm just gonna go through these last two so you guys can get to the last slide and follow up with us. Oop, 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 oop. Um, responsible actions are human-centered, they're integrated, and this is my most important thing. You solve with people, not for people. And I promise you I'm gonna slide through so we need to do good better, in essence. And um, this is part of a larger training, so if you guys are interested, feel free to pop over and email to us, and we're happy to come to your universities, your institutions, your schools, and actually start to unpack all the different parts of what I went through extremely quickly. Our goal is to connect amazing, inspiring people and resources and passions and talent 
with the challenges of solving some of the most complex global problems through the paradigm of the United Nations um, development, sustain Sustainable Development Goals. So feel free to reach out to us, uh, and I hope that I at least inspired you to now walk, leave out of here never thinking of a piece of paper the same way. Thank you.